Alright guys, Bill I'm here back with a new video and in this video I'm back with another player ranking for the latest season of Survivor, Survivor 44, where here I'll be ranking every player based on how I feel like they played on this season. And with that, let's jump right into it. We obviously have 18 players to rank here. However, I will not be ranking all 18 players just because I feel like it's weird to rank this specific person. That person being Bruce, who didn't even really get to play the game. I mean, he was there. He obviously got injured right away. He only spent one day on the island, and that entire day he was concussed. And while he did seem to build a bond with Carolyn at least we really don't have a good sense of how exactly the game would have gone I mean I think if he's still injured I think he probably just gets voted out first due to his injury though assessing him without his injury we'll just simply not know so I, I don't even feel like it's worth ranking here and obviously we're gonna see him on Survivor 45 anyway so we'll be able to truly assess his game at that point but as of right now again not feeling comfortable in actually ranking him but then now let's jump into the actual ranking at number 17 the player that didn't get immediately mad back I think played the worst game on the season ends up being Josh which is bizarre that he is at the very bottom here considering how far he makes it into the game however I really just feel like when you look at all the earlier boots they all had some merit to them well I feel like Josh's game is just a complete mess where right away he seems to be on the bottom of the original Soka tribe is lying about his profession through that people just don't trust him so no one really wanted to work with him off the bat where it seemed like his where supposedly his only connection early on was to Claire the person he later votes out but that is obviously the thing to give him some credit for is that he does survive a single tribal without any sort of immunity however when you look into why that is the case I feel like it's due to nothing that Josh does himself. It's more so based around this concept of needing to keep physical strength more so than anything Josh actively did where actually we see people still wanting to target Josh where even Claire who was supposedly was close to him early on was going for Josh in this situation and I do think it's a situation where Josh gets extremely fortunate that Matt had lost his vote where I think if it weren't for Matt losing his vote I do think there is a serious chance that Matt and Franny also side with Claire and potentially could have pulled something off though realistically I think more than likely Josh stays anyway considering I don't think Heidi was ever flipping in that situation but still it's really showing how bad of a position he is on his original try with the only reason he's being kept safe is simply due to the notion that he has more physical strength than Claire or even beyond that he seems to be the next target lined up to be taken out or then is saved by him getting swapped over to the other tribe then also completely wastes that opportunity as well where instead of trying to build bonds with the new Tika members and trying to gain numbers for a time he comes into the merge he instead burns really all of his relationships on that tribe he continues to lie to everyone about his occupation which furthers the target on his back he only survives that round through an idle play Mind you, again, he was able to get Carolyn on board. However, I credit that more so to Carolyn than anything Josh actually did. As it was a situation where I think it was more so Carolyn just actively realizing that it's probably the better path for her. But again, still needs an idol for that round. And then the following round, he would have been voted out had it not been for Matthew's medevac, where he was literally on death's door and gets saved by something completely out of his control. While I think you can argue he gets screwed over minorly through the conversation between Brandon and Danny that Carolyn watched. I think at the end of the day, I think Carolyn would have saved Jam Jam in that position anyway. I think Josh was pretty screwed and then he gets into the merge where despite him having met more people than most of the rest of the cast having literally spent time on two of the tribes he is still the consensus target where none of the people that he spent time with want to keep him and he ends up being voted out there in a near unanimous vote like I think just in general Josh plays a really bad game on paper and to be honest I think a lot of it stems back to the fact that he wasn't trusted due to the fact that he lied about his profession I think in general I don't look at Josh as like the worst player in the world I think he could be a pretty good player in certain situations though I just feel like on this season in particular I feel like everything played out as poorly as it could have and then only surviving one round of gameplay without some sort of immunity and that was a round where even there there was some walkiness to everything and he seems to be kept around only because of his physical strength and then it's perceived to be targeted for every round following that and even gets saved by an on a limb so I think it is a really bad game and because he's here number 17 now number 16 moving on to player that again this is probably the only person I truly debated with Josh and I still think there's a major argument for her being lower but at number 16 I did put Claire now again I think Claire's in a similar case I don't think Claire's the worst player in the world I think Claire could actually be a very good player if she were to return however on this season she simply didn't end up doing that much i mean obviously she was the first vote out from her tribe seemingly due to physical strength due to the fact that she sat out of challenges which i see a lot of people trying to discredit her game for that saying that as a major mistake that she made though i really don't feel like that's the case like, i really do feel like claire would have been targeted no matter what just due to the overall notion of physical strength and her actually sitting out was just more so an added excuse that they could use but really outside that claire seemed to just play kind of a fine game i mean 
mean, she had a relationship with Josh, had a relationship with Franny. She was a forward thinking player with her talking to Matthew while on the bench. But overall, I mean, Claire was just kind of fine. Again, like, I do feel like there's a serious argument for her being lower than Josh and the fact that obviously Josh survived around a gameplay that Claire went home. However, the reason why I'm having Claire above him is because I just feel like Josh is just so actively bad in every other aspect outside of the fact that he survives the travel that he went home in. And even then, it was a situation where, again, I think Claire gets kind of screwed by the fact that Matt didn't have a vote, along with the fact that they prioritized Josh's physical strength due to nothing that Josh did himself. So I do feel like as a whole, while Claire could certainly be at the bottom, I do feel like I have more things actively wrong with Josh to where. I did put Claire here at number 16. Now, number 15, moving on to another of the pre merged women, which we might be going through in a row, and that person is Helen. And Helen, for me, is like a minor step above Claire. I think they're kind of similar-ish players where they were both looked at as strategic players that were somewhat threats. However, I feel like Helen was more so voted out due to that notion than she was for the physical strength aspect of it, where it felt like Carson just simply didn't trust her for seemingly no reason. Again, it seemed like a complete incorrect read, but I do feel like Helen was generally voted out not because of her physical strength, which is actually a pro for Claire there. However, Helen at least had an ally that wanted to keep her around in Sarah, where obviously with the Claire vote, like everyone votes out Claire. Where, I mean, to be fair, everyone votes out Helen, though obviously that's because Sarah had lost her vote. But again, that's the one major uptick here for Helen in my mind is the fact that she at least had an ally like Sarah that was willing to fight for her, where Claire didn't really have that even with Franny. So again, to me, it feels like a minor improvement on Claire. Next up at number 14, we have another improvement upon Helen. This is probably the person that has bigger issues with their game. And at number 14, we have the first boot of the season in Maddie. And Maddie was obviously a mess on this season where she was the first boot of the season. However, she was the first boot due to being idled out of the game, which shows that, okay, she had people on her side. However, at the same time, she gets out of the game because of her own plan, her own plan of putting all the votes on Brandon, despite the fact that she knows that he has an idol is really ridiculous to begin with. However, beyond that, again, she did have people on her side. Now, I would not say it's necessary the outright majority as this was a situation where literally only three people end up voting to where the only person we know like solidly is on her side is Kane though again in comparison to Helen Helen only had Sarah so that's already something that at least matches that for Maddie but still Maddie seems to organize his plan and is able to get both Jamie and Lauren to seemingly agree with it though neither of them actually go through with it because they both give up their votes by the end but we do see a misstep from her and her telling this plan to Matthew, who ends up leaking her plan back to Brandon, which leads to her being sniped out of the game here. Again, all of it's like very, very messy. But again, like I feel like she showed a lot more agency in the game than any of the people we've talked about so far and also showed effectiveness in the game more than anyone we talked about so far. While the plan ends up backfiring on her, I do feel like the fact that she was able to put together this plan and almost pull it through is better than anything the people we've already talked about did. So again, because of that for me, Maddie is being a step above them here at number 14. At number 13, we're moving on to a player that, what do you know, ends up being the last woman eliminated pre-merge, and that person is Sarah. And Sarah has a massive mixed bag of a game in my mind, where Sarah plays a game where she is in the initial majority. She seems to be part of this alliance with Helen and Carson. She just seems to have this really close relationship with Helen. However, then she's immediately blindsided when Carson flips on her and would have been dead to rights had they gone to another tribal. However, they don't until Josh gets swapped over. However, Josh gets swapped over with an idol that ends up blowing up in her face. And while in a way you could say that's unlucky, it kind of isn't that unlucky in the fact that, again, if Tika had gone to tribal, she would have gone home anyway. Like, it's more so a situation where she had a potential saving grace and didn't didn't end up getting that saving grace. And even then, I actually fault Sarah for not getting that saving grace. To where when Josh flips over, I feel like she should have done what Carolyn did. In telling Josh that she's on the bottom and try to work alongside him and keep herself safe for the following round, I could have put her in the middle of the following round. Yet instead, she decides to keep with the Tikas and continue to target Josh, which leaves us really vulnerable there. We obviously also have her fake idol situation with her finding it and thinking it's real and not ending up playing it, which again, like at the end of the day, it was a fake idol anyway. However, I also feel like it's really bad that she wouldn't have played the idol even if it was a real idol because she thought it was real. So I think that's all really bad as well. However, again, like for me, the reason why she is a step above who we've already talked about is she survives a tribal in the Helen vote. But beyond that, she tactically gets Io out of the game. 
And while she would have gone home anyway if they'd gone to another tribal, I do feel like she did some decent work in repairing her relationships with the likes of Jan, Jim, and Carson. So again, it's not all bad, so because that for me, she's here at number 13. Now number 12, we're moving finally into the post-merge here with a player that is one that is so weird to assess due to the fact that somehow he made it very deep in the game despite somehow never being vulnerable for a vote and even then could have been the first move of the season and that person is Brandon. And again, like he just plays such a weird game here where he is obviously this big physical guy that you would typically look at as this locked-in player to make the merge yet despite that, he was almost the first boot. Mind you, again, under very wonky circumstances where a lot of people didn't end up voting there and it would have been a two to one vote taking him out though again it almost happened where had it not been for his idol he would have been pretty dead in the water there though i will say he does good enough work to build a relationship with matthew to where matthew tells him to play his idol which plays into his decision there though again like really the entire round was pretty sloppy play particularly in his relationship to maddie which seemed like he just burned that relationship for seemingly no reason though after that vote he does recover pretty well where while he doesn't go to another tribal until the merge he doesn't seem to be in any danger on that tribe where it feels like the power structure flips a bit to where he ends up building a really strong relationship with lauren while matthew ends up building a strong bond with kane with jamie being the major swing in that position though still in a position where they would have voted out lauren over him so again it feels like he's relatively safe moving forward then we get to the merge where do the mergatory he's not in any danger however i also don't think he would have gone home there anyway i think josh would have been a target however then we get to the weird split tribal at final 11 to where that's a situation where obviously he wins immunity however even if he didn't win immunity he wouldn't have gone home again he was part of the rat 2 group though i do think if this was a normal tribal at final 11 i do think he could have potentially been in danger with that being a pretty opportune time to snipe him out of the game which what do you know at the final time we see him getting sniped out of the game in position where obviously he's idled out of the game but he's not really though where in reality tika's had won him out but recognized the opportunity to keep their cover and through that didn't vote him out but in reality he had the majority of the votes knowing he was going home and was willing to let him go so i don't feel like it really balances out his initial save by an idol to where i still look at his game overall mostly negative now again despite the fact that he goes home at the first opportunity i do feel like he was relatively safe for most of the season i think it's only these major danger spots as first tribal and his last tribal while every other tribal is one where he's relatively safe however again i still think there's some poor play in all this in him burning his relationship with maddie early on and then even in his boot round we get talk about how he was the one that didn't want to split which again i don't necessarily know if that's the full story though it still seems like a situation where he wasn't proactive enough in organizing a split vote mind you again like i think at the end of the day if they did split the vote then tico would just vote him out anyway but i feel like it's still something to call out like i mean for me brandon played a solid like middle game though i feel like his bookends are pretty lackluster especially his beginning of the season which is what does move him quite a bit down on the list for me here at number 12 now number 11 moving on to player that despite most people online seeming to think of this person as a good player i actually don't think they played that good of a game and at number 11 i do have franny and just in general like i think franny is probably a bit overstated as a player on this season while there are points where she does seem to have decent reads on the game i feel like she's just mostly ineffective in most of the things that she's trying to do um, she does seem to be well positioned on the original Soka tribe, though obviously her relationship with Matt does put a target on her back to where we do see at one point there being a coalition to take out Matt and Franny, though that never seems to actually go through as obviously by the time that we get to the vote, it ends up being Claire. Though that's a situation where Franny wants to keep Claire and ends up failing at doing so, with her failing to get Heidi on her side, essentially losing that battle against Danny. Then we get to the merge where that position, she is actively targeting Josh, which I do think for Ahsoka's in general is not the optimal move. It just feels like a completely unnecessary move to be making at that point to get rid of someone that was actually on their side. Now at the final 11, she does get a bit unlucky in how everything plays out to where obviously she gets separated from Matt in a position where Matt is very clearly going home. However, at the same time, she had the opportunity to throw the challenge to save Matt and also keep herself safe and she doesn't end up doing that, essentially accidentally letting Matt go home and then also fails to convince Heidi to try to execute a plan to actually save Matt and also just has the wrong idea of how to save Matt herself in with her telling Heidi to go and vote Jam Jam, which I think is a misguided play to begin with. And also Heidi goes through with it, not because she actually wants to help Franny out, but actually the opposite, because she wants to get rid of Matt to separate Matt and Franny. Then we get the final time where she's a very clear target and gets saved by an autoplay. Mind you, again, I do think she would have been safe anyway as i do feel like the tikas would have saved her had it not been for the idol play but still she is a massive target at that point in the game 
is completely out of the loop at the final nine vote, where despite the fact that she was saved by Danny in previous vote, Danny is still excluding her from plans and plans on taking her out in the near future, where we obviously see her eventual boot round, where she's just simply looked at as the biggest threat on the board and is taken out pretty unceremoniously. And I do feel like overall, it's a pretty bad game. I mean, while there are some decent instincts at points, I don't feel like she ever utilizes that potential to any significant degree. I feel like she never actually executes on anything that she attempts to do, where she fails to save Claire, she accidentally gets Matt voted out, she gets saved by an idol from Danny, only to build no social capital with him, and is left on the cane vote, only to then be blindsided herself. Like, I think overall it is a pretty bad game, but one that did obviously make it relatively far with a decent amount of win equity, which is why she's here at number 11. Now, number 10, we're moving on to a player that I'm largely conflicted on this person. I think this is a person that was obviously shown on the show to not be that good of a player. However, when looking at just their raw game, I think am just largely conflicted on it and that person is jamie now again jamie largely got a big dodo edit on the season obviously a lot of focus on her overconfidence and her fake idol however beyond that i think jamie played a fine game on this season now it does start off a bit rough where supposedly jamie was the initial target on the original ratu tribe and would have gone home until the entire brandon fiasco happened and maddie tried to flip the votes however this obviously leads to jamie being the first ever successful user of the shot in the dark which didn't matter at all, though it shows a somewhat correct read on her end, though also an incorrect read and not realizing that the votes have flipped by that point. But again, after that, she ends up not going to tribal again until the merge, though is in a position where she's essentially in the middle. Again, not due to anything I think she actually did, more so due to luck, but and it seems like there are these two sides of Brandon and Lauren and Kane and Matthew to where she is essentially the swing between the two. Though obviously it is here where we also see her find the fake idol, which is her essentially being manipulated into working with Matthew. Then we obviously see her get soft Ahsoka to where she doesn't really seem to do much of substance there doesn't really seem to build that many bonds in that group and really just as a whole feels like a wasted opportunity but then she gets to the merge where at the merge she is the most well connected player on the board she's the person that has met the most amount of people in the game however despite that she doesn't really seem to do anything with that kind of just falling back with the rat two group and not really seeming to even attempt to work with soka moving forward which seemed like a wasted opportunity she then gets to the map vote where she's very fortunate in just finding herself in a good position with a Ratu majority. Though again, still was probably not in any danger of going home during that round. Though she does continuously have a bit of a target on her back due to the notion that people think that she has an idol, which is humorous considering the fact that she obviously doesn't have an idol. But again, she's blindsided on the Brandon vote, didn't know anything that was going on there. And at the Kane vote, she's also once again blindsided in a position where she thinks Kane got voted out with an idol in her pocket, which is all pretty bad, showing her mystery and thinking that Kane was safe. Though at the same time, again, at the end of the day, it was a fake idol and doesn't really affect her game too, too much moving forward outside of her losing her closest ally. But the following that, she is back in the majority, working alongside Lauren and kind of being this swing vote, initially siding with Danny and voting out Franny and then flipping back with the Tikas to vote out Danny. Again, like decent play there, which is kind of what elevates her on the list here, so along with the fact that she makes it all the way to the final six. Though again, it's a final six. I do think she makes a mixed guy play at seven, where while again, she is in the majority there in his major swing vote in the decision there. And while it's a position where I think she gets screwed over by Lauren and immunity, where Lauren went home over her, I do feel like it's also a position that she kind of put herself in, where while she, again, she was a major swing vote during the final seven vote, it's also a position where I think they make the incorrect decision. You know, by voting out Danny, it really just gives Tika the outright majority there to where it really just gave them too much power in that position, which obviously leads to her being voted out there. I do feel like that was a bit of a misguided play, but outside of that, I feel like Jamie's last few rounds were pretty solid. However, the rest of her game was extremely rocky with there being many points where she's either left on the outs or was in potential danger or had a target on her back due to her idol. Again, like there's a lot of questionable things in her game, which is why for me, she lands here at number 10. Now, number nine, we're moving on to a player that I really don't know what to do with this player, where I feel like this is one of the tougher players to assess because there's very little inherently bad that this person does. However, they always seem to be just in a bad spot. And that person is Kane. Now again, Kane is a player that I, I think gets a bit underestimated as someone that people look at as this person that really didn't have that good of a position throughout most of the game, was constantly on the bottom. However, I feel like he got really unlucky to get in those positions and actually played pretty well despite those situations. In terms of like the moves he makes on this season, I don't necessarily disagree with a lot of decisions he ends up making. Again, like in the first round, he does side with Maddie, his ride or die, and votes out Brandon. Only they get screwed over by the fact that Brandon plays. I don't mind you again. They didn't need to put the votes on Brandon. However, also at the same time, in that position, Kane had a good relationship with Matthew and through that wouldn't want to vote Matthew out either. So really, I think this is more so just kind of a failing and stopping this plan from going through to begin with. But still, he is technically in the majority for that vote. However, after that, he ends up being 
one of the people in danger. Again, I do think it would have been Lauren or Cain that would have went home if they went to another tribal, with Cain probably being the initial target. But again, we see Cain having built a good relationship with Matthew, where Matthew is willing to fight for him and even tries to cultivate this relationship with Jamie in order to flip Jamie over to their side to save Cain. And even after Carson ends up swapping over, we see Cain do pretty good work in trying to build the relationship with Carson. To where again, doesn't end up being that effective long term, but I do think it builds enough of a relationship to where I do think Carson would have sided with Cain and Matthew in that position. And coming to the merge, again, he seems to be a consensus split vote option. However, he once again seemed to do pretty proactive work in getting the vote off of him. However, beyond that, I think his game is a little bit more rocky, obviously. Like, in the split tribal, I do think had his tribe gone to tribal, I think he would have been a very clear target of someone just to easily vote out in that position. So, I think he gets saved by how the tribes are split, though at the same time, he also gets kind of screwed over by the fact that the tribes are split that way. But then we get to the final 10, where obviously he's left out of the vote gets blindsided when Brandon ends up going home and then ends up being blindsided himself the following round. It is kind of a weird game where like he is on the bottom for a lot of it. However, I feel like he's on the bottom not due to things he actively does most of the time. And towards the end, he does get pretty cocky in the game and that is a knock there. But I really feel like, like a lot of his pre-merge game in particular is him actually playing kind of decently, but things just simply not going his way. Though he gets taken out in a situation where he technically thinks he has an idol in his pocket and he doesn't play it. Obviously misreading that situation. So again, that's kind of bad as as well but again kind of a mixed game i think he actually plays a better game than probably most people would typically get him credit for and because that for me he is here at number nine now number eight we're moving on to a player that kind of like kane ends up being this very unlucky player in the game when that kind of gets screwed over in his eventual boots there's a reason why he's this high and at number eight i do have matt and Matt is a player that, again, like I think he largely gets screwed over in the fact that he goes home in that split tribal twist. This twist where he essentially gets swap screwed into a position where it's either him or Jam Jam, and he's not able to get his bag to play a shot in the dark or use his fake idol and try to do something with it. It's kind of just a really bad position he's put in and one that he's just instantly screwed over in a game. And to be honest, that is the reason why he's probably a bit elevated on this list. That's really outside that his game is largely fine. I mean, he is working alongside Franny. Obviously, they're a really solid final two right away. And while that does put a bit of a target on their back it doesn't really seem to ever actually catch up to them to where Ozzy Claire ends up going first and if they were to go to another tribal before Josh had come in Josh would have been booted and more than likely Jamie would have been the consensus boot had she been swapped over though obviously she would have had an idol and through that maybe Matt would have been sniped out of the game though again that would be another pretty unlucky situation for him but we do see him become a pretty major player at the merge to where we do see him being a major broker during the Josh vote which again taking out Josh might be a questionable move for Matt I don't know if that's how he should approach that round considering Josh did seem to want to work with him but still at least effective in getting that plan to go through and then we just see him orchestrate this vote against Danny now see we never get to see go through and who knows if it would have gone through but I think it does show you that he has a lot of agency in the game and again like I think he overall just gets really screwed in that final 11 round where there's not really much of a chance for him to survive especially with the fact that Soka has so much more numbers than Tika does at that point and also is his relationship with Franny now I think you can argue that okay Heidi used her advantage in a way that didn't save Matt and was kind of intentionally doing so which is a knock against Matt that Heidi didn't even want to save him but I still feel like as a whole Matt does get largely screwed over in that situation and I feel like if he did survive it he would have had a decent amount of options moving forward and it's kind of that what if that kind of leaves him as high in the list here as number eight and number seven we're moving on to a player that it is very strange having this player so high especially considering he doesn't make it that far into the season but I feel like as a whole he is a player that had so much potential and I do think he had a very deep run in him and that person is Matthew now again seven feels a bit high it does feel ridiculous that someone that was taken out in episode five is as high on the list but i do think it really shows you how much potential i do think matthew had i think matthew played a pretty savvy game while he was there i mean he plays that first round pretty masterfully and how he's able to build a pretty strong bond with both brandon and kane i do think his relationship with kane is part of the reason why the votes end up flipping onto brandon instead of matthew while also end up alerting Brandon to the fact that the votes are going on him, while also playing a shot in the dark to conceal his vote, which allows him to still play the middle following that. And following that, he seems to be relatively safe, despite the fact that he has an injured shoulder and should be a very easy person to vote out. Yeah, he instead seems to be this person that's kind of situated in the middle, still having the relationship with Brandon, building this relationship with Jamie through use of a fake idol, which again is very impressive play on him, and a pretty proactive one that I don't think we've really seen before, while also still having his relationship with Kane that we learned from after the show is extremely close, and that his work on Jamie was essentially a plot to save Kane in the game. And also when Carson ends up swapping over, we see him instantly try to pull Carson over, 
to where, again, I don't know how effective it would have been long term, but I do think at least it would have worked out for him short term. And, and Matthew just seemed to be a very strong player, very proactive player, very impressive player during his short run on this season. But obviously it gets cut short. Though I think it's a situation where if he came to emerge, I think he would have been in a very solid spot. Now, again, I don't know if it lasts him all the way to the end of the game. I do think it is a situation where I would expect him to be like a final seven, final eight boot, kind of in this Shan mold of someone that does have a lot of agency early on, but eventually catches up on them as them being a big threat. I do kind of see that path for Matthew. So I do think it would have definitely given the Tikas a lot more of a run for their money. And just overall, I do find his game to be one that demonstrated a lot of potential which is the reason he's as high as he is here at number seven. Now at number six, we're moving on to the end gamers now. This is a person that I was largely conflicted on where to assess him, especially considering the fact that we hear that they have a lot of win equity if they were to get to the end. But I struggle with my overall assessment of this player. And at number six, I do have Lauren. And again, for me, Lauren is a bit of a tough one to crack here, where again, she does get talked about as someone that could have won if she had gotten to the end. She obviously comes extremely close to that, where if she survived that final five round, would she whether through winning immunity or having an idol, she would have then had at least a chance at fire making and would have and then would have been in this position to potentially win, especially if Carson's not around. Though that isn't the fact. And there's a reason why that isn't the fact. And that's because she is on the outs by the time of the final five, which is pretty bad. And when looking through the rest of her game, it is kind of rocky where she does obviously survive that first round and gets her extra vote, but is caught in that situation. Even then, Matthew is wanting to directly target her. And really, Matthew ends up targeting Lauren for really the rest of his run. I think the fact that Matthew ends up having to quit the game ends up being a massive boon to Lauren. As, I mean, straight up, I don't know how exactly that rat to try plays out but again we do hear that matthew and kane are working together to target lauren and that jamie was the swing in that position later carson was the swing so i do think the fact that it was either lauren or kane going home if they had gone to tribal once again is something that i do knock against her but even then we come into the merge and i feel like she's kind of a background player for a bit but not really having that much agency in the game early on either as he eventually being blindsided with brandon goes home being completely outplayed by the tikas there and following that up with her being blindsided by the Kane vote. Oh, while her supposedly having this final four with Jamie, Carson, and Jam Jam, a final four that ended up kind of manipulating her into keeping the Tikas around in a position where she clearly shouldn't have. As it seems to be a major reason why she sides with the Tikas and Danny and voting out Franny, and also why she ends up not voting out Carson at the final seven, which is a pretty ridiculous move in allowing the Tikas to have a majority coming to the final six, which I think is a really damning move for me as it really just leads to her being on the bottom following that, the where she would have been booted at six had she not won immunity, and she's obviously booted at five. Like, again, I think her game is a very rocky one, where really the reason why she is this high is because of her supposed win equity, but really I think the rest of her game is just, like, slightly better than Jamie's, and actually kind of worse in a way that I feel like she was actually being targeted more so throughout a lot of the game than Jamie. So again, it is a rocky game. I do feel like her win equity and her coming relatively close to actually just being able to win out to the end is what leaves her as high as she is here at number six. At number five, we're moving on to a player that, again, I look at kind of similarly to Lauren, though I think probably made less blatant strategic mistakes, though was also just someone with a lot less win equity, and that person is Heidi. Now again, Heidi is someone that I think struggles to win in most scenarios. I don't really see the combination where Heidi wins outside of maybe a Heidi, Carolyn, Jamie final three, but even that one's a bit rocky. However, I think Heidi's game, for the most part, for the first like two thirds of the game was pretty solid. I mean, she was in the middle of the original Soka tribe, being a main decision maker in the Claire vote, though also in a position where she creates this really strong bond with Danny, while also seemingly having good relationships with the likes of Matt and Franny as well. And again, if they had ever gone to tribal again, I do think she was relatively safe. I don't think the Jamie Ida would have backfired on her. Then we get to the merge, where again, like she is part of the vote against Josh, which I do think is questionable. Again, Soka going after each other, especially for no real reason in that position does seem a bit misguided, but she is still involved in that plan. She obviously is part of Matt's boot as well, the where she gets the power to steal a vote from the opposite tribe, a power that she ends up essentially wasting, though kind of intentionally so, where it did seem like she wanted to split up Matt and Franny, which also to me, again, is a bit of a misguided play, especially to do at Final 11, where so much after the game, you take out Matt and Franny, especially with Franny being a close ally of yours, again, it did feel a bit ridiculous. But following this, I think she does pretty decent work, kind of being a lead figure and getting rid of Brandon and Kane, being the person to tell Danny to go through those moves, though at the same time, and does seem to be a big mover and shaker at that point in the game. Though again, it's after the Kane boot that I think her game just completely crumbles, to where during the Franny boot, like she's 
completely on the outs there where there seems to be this women coalition coming together however Heidi ends up being the only person that actually stick true to that where even the likes of Franny and Carolyn end up flipping their votes onto Heidi well Heidi herself ends up voting for Danny her closest ally in the game and all that is really bad and we follow that up with her being able to win Danny back siding with him only for Danny to then go home himself making her not involved in Danny's eventual boots and we have final six we have her wasting her idol in a situation that was a complete misread on her end and while she didn't need it for final five I do feel like still it's a knock against her and really it's more so indicative of at final five for her just simply not being a threat in the game at that point with you having the likes of jam jam carson and lauren are all looked at as bigger threats but i feel like her wasting her idol here is really just a summation of my issues with her entire game it's like the fact that she continues to find these advantages in the game and continuously waste them not using them to really do anything in the game is a massive issue to me especially at the final six here where there was a massive move that she could have made where at the final six she obviously could have played the idol on jamie saving her and taking out one of the tika is a move that would have been a massive move for her resume and a move that would have put her in the middle in the following round between these two sides or even if she doesn't trust the likes of jamie and lauren she could have just continued to play the idol on herself but vote with jamie and lauren which in doing so that would cause a 3-3 tie where with jamie now immune due to having three of the votes on her Heidi now immune due to having immunity and Lauren having the immunity necklace that means that Tika is guaranteed to go home in that situation as well once again putting her in the middle in the following round like to me it just feels like a massive wasted opportunity for her not to go through this move I know a move that people argue that makes sense that she doesn't make the move because she doesn't trust Lauren and Jamie because they voted for her previous tribals but I think that really just shows you again the lower level of gameplay that Heidi displays the fact that she isn't willing to work with these people that had previously voted for her despite the fact she worked with carolyn who did vote for her to me it feels like a primitive style of play that essentially guarantees her loss one due to the lack of moves that she makes across the season but also the fact that she's going to the end against these much bigger jury threats i mean to me it's moves like those that really separate the good from the great players and i think heidi simply just isn't that great of a player because of her being unwilling to look past the fact that lauren and jamie voted for her to make a move that could have potentially won her the game but now they give a credit to her again i agree with her move to throw herself in the fire at final four i think it is something that she needed to add to her resume to gain more respect from the jury but again it still simply wasn't enough and really that is the thing is i think she struggles in most final three scenarios i don't know what final three she could have gone to to where she would have outright won outside of maybe carolyn and jamie and even then i think that one's a bit up in the air like i do feel like heidi really struggles with winning the game on this season despite the fact that i feel like she has decent play for first like two two-thirds of the game and even at the end has that move of throwing herself in fire but i really feel like as a whole her game is one of a lot of missed opportunities but considering her being able to navigate herself to the very end she's as high as she is here at number five at number four moving on to a player that i can't believe this person's number four especially considering i don't even think this person played that good of a game but they seem to have a decent amount of win equity by the end and also had a decent amount of control in the game and that person is danny now again I don't think Danny's the best player in the world. I think he made a lot of questionable decisions in the game, but he did have a decent amount of agency in the game. Again, like right away on the Soka tribe, he builds this really strong bond with Heidi. Despite the fact that Heidi was kind of playing the middle, she ends up essentially playing for Danny, where the decision to take out Claire over Josh was one that was done simply because Heidi didn't want to go against Danny in that position. And again, beyond that, I think Danny would have been relatively safe, though he also finds the idol and ends up hiding the fake idol, the which all that seems to kind of blow up in his face with Matt eventually finding out and wanting to target him because of that, which again pretty bad move there but gets an emerge as i mentioned before questionable decision targeting josh don't know why danny in particular wants to do that especially considering he wanted to use josh as a shield but again still effective in getting him out he kind of fails at the matt vote to convince heidi to save matt so again that's kind of bad which is also a position where matt was going after him anyways so again it's kind of a weird section of the game there though following this the next three rounds of the game he is essentially running the game mind you it's because the tikas are essentially letting him run the game but it doesn't change the fact that he did have a decent amount of control here and him utilizing his his idol to take out Franny. Mind you, again, that's a situation where Atika's intentionally voted the other way to make him play his idol, but still, a pretty savvy move there to weaken the Rattus. He then still remains in control while taking out Kane. And then during the Franny vote, despite there initially being a coalition to take him out, we do see him eventually get his way. Now, again, targeting Franny, is that the best move for Danny at this point in the game? Again, that's questionable, but I still think he has a decent amount of agency at that point in the game, and Ozzy gets booed the following round, though gets booed in a situation where people that outplay him are higher on this list. And I do think Danny was in this position where I do think he had a decent amount of win equity in the game. So again, while I don't necessarily agree with a lot of his strategic decisions, it doesn't change the fact that he did have a decent amount of control in the game. Though obviously he does struggle with having a path to the end, which I don't think really anyone would have taken to the end. But again, like this is essentially 
a cast of a lot of players that didn't play the greatest games in the world. Even though I don't think they're all like bad players. I think most of this cast is actually pretty solid players. I think all of them have pretty big holes in their game and Danny is included. But I think Danny's win equity and his amount of control in the game is what keeps him high enough to be here number four. Now number three, and obviously the final three on this list here are Tika three. That should be no surprise. However, at number three here, the one at the bottom of those three ends up being Carolyn, which to me, this is by a pretty wide margin. I think the top two are definitively the top two by quite a bit. To me, Carolyn is a notch below that. To where while she is involved in the Tika 3, I feel like she's the least integral to the success of the Tika 3. I think she is the person that is clearly on the bottom of those three, was less involved in the overall strategic decision making, and really had a lot less of the social capital that allowed them to pull off what they pulled off. Now again, I'm not saying that Carolyn is a bad player. I think Carolyn played pretty well given her skill set and did pull off some decent moves here and there by just in comparison to the other two down the road she's not quite on that level now carolyn does start off in a bit of a rocky position where she's left out of the initial majority alliance so by the time of the first tribal she's obviously in this really strong relationship with both jam jam and carson that end up running the table though even then that has a bit of sloppy play with her giving sarah the fake idol and whatnot which i feel like could have easily backfired on her but again the overall sarah round is pretty impressive play from her i do think the way that she's able to pull over josh and get josh to vote out sarah there the biggest adversary for carolyn in particular while also putting her in a middle position for the following round is very impressive play the issue is that again i think she kind of throws that away the following round where instead of still playing the middle i think she very solidly sides with jam jam over josh which i think makes josh more willing to vote out carolyn than he is jam jam by the end of that round mind you it doesn't matter as they don't go to tribal anyway but i think it is a misplay from carolyn in her kind of giving up on that and then we get to the merge where it feels like at that point all of her agency is kind of just stripped from her where she's kind of just there as really a lot of the game plays out where josh goes home she's not really that involved in it despite the edit kind of propping her up as being right about things people don't really listen to her and obviously a lot of that does come from biases on her overall personality though i think it also still shows this general lack of respect people had for her while out there which is again kind of part of the game is building up this respect for the jury to eventually vote for you which again i don't think carolyn was necessarily a massive goat at the end however i do think out of the end game players i do find it tough to believe her winning any of those end game scenarios outside of her Heidi and jamie which again i still think is very close considering she obviously loses against jam jam i think she loses against carson lauren danny franny again i think it's very tough to look at a winning scenario for her by the end game and even beyond that even though the tikas are able to take control again i still feel like her game as an individual is still pretty rocky where during the brandon vote she's the only tika to actually vote brandon out mind you i'm pretty sure that was a planned split vote to kind of make people think that the tikas weren't working together but again she seemed to be the less integral person in that grouping being the person that was going to vote with the soka simply because amjam and Carson had better relationships with the Rattus, which kind of shows Carolyn's lack of social capital in the game. We then follow that up with the Kane vote, where she tries to take out Danny and ends up failing at doing so. The Franny vote is kind of a similar thing, to where she wants to save Franny. She also wants to take out Danny. That plan doesn't go through. She switches it to Heidi, but even fails at getting that, being completely blindsided by her own alliance in that position. And eventually have Danny actually being taken out, where she obviously plays the idol there, though the idol is completely unnecessary, as both Jan Jam and Carson had good enough relationships to where Lauren and Jamie were going to save them over Danny anyway. Again, I think Karen's role in that round was pretty much entirely pointless. And really through that, all she really does is make herself a bigger target to where people start to talk about how underestimated she is, even though she doesn't really gain anything from playing that idol. And again, she simply just does not have the relationships with Lauren and Jamie to pull any weight during the eventual Jamie vote. Where again, I feel like at that point, her win equity is just so low that she should be trying to get to the end with Jamie, but instead seemingly ends up wanting to go to the end with the Tika 3. To where again, we obviously see her get to the end. To where again, it just simply looks like the jury just respected the likes of Jan, Jim, and Carson way more than her. And we're never really going to vote for her over those two. And just in general, I think she struggles with the jury vote. And again, like I think as a whole, her game is pretty rocky. There are moments of brilliance. I think her play during the Sarah round in particular is very, very impressive. But I do think the rest of her game is kind of overstated as being that great. To where it's like fine. Again, a solid like middle tier sort of player, but not really one that had that much agency in the game and most of the time that she tried to have agency she kind of failed at what she was doing especially in the post-merge so because that again i do feel like she's 
a big bag of a player, but one that still lands here number three. Now number two, and again, the top two here are very tough. The top two are by far the two best players of the season, and I don't think it's really close. However, I do think it is very close between the two. I think one had more win equity than the other. However, one had better positioning and threat management than the other. However, the worst position one had more agency and more control over the game, while the other one, again, still had control, but was a bit more in the backseat. So again, it is a bit tough. However, at number two, I am going to go with Carson. Now again, Carson is a player that I think if he got to the end, I think he would have won. I think it would have been a landslide for him, where it did seem like a lot of the jury seemed to credit him as the mastermind of the Tika 3. And to be honest, I don't necessarily disagree with that sentiment. I do think it is very clear that Carson was the most active strategic player of the three and was also the person that was leading a lot of the strategy talks and also had these other relationships with the remaining players. Where again, the fact that he comes into the merge, having seemingly convinced the Rat Twos that he's with them while also still having the Tika 3 and also seems to build this bond with like some Matt and Franny and also seemingly Danny as well. Again, all that is very, very impressive. The way he's able to position himself at the early portion of the merge. And considering he has this very similar skill at the beginning of the game as well with his playing of the middle between Janjum and Carolyn and Helen and Sarah is also very impressive. It seems like he's a master at kind of being able to blend into any group and again, really expertly navigates through the post-merge where, again, during the Brandon vote, he is able to take out Brandon, weakening the Rattus while all still voting with Brandon and keeping his alliances there. He's then able to take out Kane in a position where, again, they assume that Carson was with them because he voted them in the previous round when in reality, he's been against them the entire time. The Franny boot obviously has him still keeping Danny around as a shield for him, which he ends up taking out in the following round in the position where Carolyn is willing to play his idol on him. And I really, I feel like the Danny round is also the greatest display of the Tika's game. And that being the moment where this final four deal with Jamie, Lauren, Jam Jam, and Carson ends up really playing to their favor, really showing you the impressiveness of Carson's game at that point. And really at that point, it's just them picking off the remaining Ratu members, though also, this is the point where Carson starts to become a bigger target, and that's kind of the issue here, is that Carson is this big threat in the game, and is very known as this big threat, to a point where I don't know if he has a path to the end outside of winning out. But when he wasn't good at fire making, especially over other people that he was at the end with, it does make his overall path to the end a lot more rocky. It puts him in a very similar position to how Jesse was in 43, where he essentially needed to win one of the final challenges and simply couldn't. However, again, I think his win equity is really off the roof to where I think he wins against literally anybody at the end. It seemed like there was just so much respect for Carson at the end of the game. That's something that definitely bolsters my overall opinion of him. But it's still one that, again, doesn't really have the solid path to the end. But again, considering how dynamic of a game he played up to that point, again, he really was playing the middle and was able to flip back and forth alongside the other Tikas and really lead the Tikas through the game, seemingly having the most agency in who goes home. But that's even seen conversations between him and Jam Jam where he has to convince Jam Jam which way to vote. Again, it is a very, very impressive game, though kind of one of these that just struggles with getting to the very, very end. And because that, for me, he is here number two. Now, number one, the number one player of Survivor 44 is unsurprisingly the winner in Jam Jam. Again, like, I think it is close between Carson and Jam Jam. To me, Jam Jam has the massive pros of the fact that I think his overall positioning at the end game is much better. He had a much smoother path to the end of the game than, like, Carson. However, again, Carson has these massive pros of the fact that I think Carson would beat Jam Jam at the end. Well, also, I think Carson got his way over Jam Jam multiple points in the season. Also, it was just a straight-up better position during an early merge portion of the game. So, again, I do think it is a very close debate there, though I do think it is the impressive of Jam Jam's endgame position ends up bolstering him here. Now again, Jam Jam to start the game, not in as good a position as Carson. He is alongside Carolyn as being one of the two sides that Carson could pick between. Though again, he has this very strong bond with Carson, builds a final two with him right off the bat. That ends up being one of the reasons why Carson ends up siding with Jam Jam. Now following this, we obviously see him play pretty poorly during the Sarah round where Sarah ends up being blindsided. Jam Jam himself is blindsided during that round, though also in a way like he was kind of screwed over there by Josh being added to the game, though obviously you do have the fault of for not taking the opportunity to build a bond with Josh, which really felt like a wasted opportunity for Jam Jam. The following that round, again, we see him build his relationship back up with Carolyn, which is pretty impressive work, and even by the end of that round, it did feel like Josh was more willing to vote out Carolyn than he was Jam Jam, so again, I think Jam Jam plays that round pretty well, putting himself back in the middle, kind of taking the middle spot from Carolyn, and once we get to the merge, I mean, even though 
he's on the bottom i do think he does pretty decent work in keeping the target off of his back or again the fact that they take out josh over jam jam is just really mind-blowing there and really just shows you strengths of jam jam social game as it really should have been a clear-cut vote for jam jam but then we get to final 11 where again he saved over matt now again i don't know how much credit i'll give jam jam for that as i just think that matt was such a clear juicy target at that point because i think he separated from all of his allies and simply has more allies but still i think you have to give some credit for jam jam especially in the fact that he is able to utilize this to really build a strong bond with the rat twos to where it keeps the rat twos in line moving forward making them think that jam jam is on their side where we even see that at the brandon vote where jam jam is able to play the middle there and is able to vote with brandon to make it seem like he's still with the rat twos though following that we do get to the kane vote where he's able to flip back take out kane or taking out kane is definitely a move that greatly benefited jam jam there continuing to weaken the rat twos while also him not being perceived as someone that's flipped back and forth at that point but again we have him taking out franny and a position where they obviously blindside carolyn you can question whether or not that was the right call but i do feel like for jam jam in particular it probably was the right call again it does isolate carolyn to where she doesn't really have many options after that while also it keeps danny in the game someone that's a big target for them to use as a shield so again that's all impressive play and again i think the danny round is some impressive play as well to where again there is talk about targeting jam jam earlier in the episode i don't think it actually would have happened again based on the talks that we've seen postseason it does very much seem like jamie and lauren were all in on this final four with jam jam and carson at that point to where i do think jam jam would have been safe either way and again it is this final four deal they make early on in the season that allows them to take control of the end game stretch there to where we get to final six where at that point the tikas pretty much have the numbers though this is where we do get to a bit of a questionable decision for jam jam where jam jam starts to target carolyn which he starts to recognize that carolyn could be a threat which i do think is a misread on his end not the fact that carolyn could be a threat but the fact that carolyn would be more of a threat than him and we do see Carson having to convince him to not go through this plan, which is a minor knock against him. But he is able to get the final four, taking out Jamie and Lauren along the way. Also remaining safe despite the fact of being vulnerable in those positions. And in final four, again, like at that point, there's no real doubt that he's going to make it to the end. He should easily win fire. But also just Carson was looked at as a bigger threat. And again, that is the impressiveness of Jam Jam's game is the fact that by the end game stretch, he still had these bigger threats in the game. And Danny, Lauren, and Carson that were all looked at as bigger threats than him, despite the fact that I think Jam Jam would give them a run for their money especially anyone but Carson and it seemed like a lot of this came from the fact that he was just so good socially where it felt like he was in this position where he was so good socially that where people kind of felt bad about wanting to target him and just generally didn't want to target him over the likes of Lauren and Danny who they just simply didn't like as much where whenever people talk about voting Jam Jam we get talk about how people feel bad about wanting to vote out Jam Jam and really I think Jam Jam ends up being one of the best social players we've ever seen again he just has this natural charisma to him which really just makes him such a likable presence I mean, we see the jury constantly laughing whenever he talks. He get these scenes of him back at camp where he really feels like the life of the party and him cracking these jokes left and right. Like, it just feels very clear that Jam Jam is one of the best social players we've ever seen. To the point where it felt like he was in this really masterful position towards the end of the game where, again, he had these massive targets in front of him, but he also had these really solid deals that made it so that he was almost guaranteed to make it to Final Four to where he was one of the best fire makers on the board to where it should have been pretty clear he was going to make it to the end. But again, he had this Final Three with Tika. He had Heidi winding to go to the end with him he had this final four deal with jamie and lauren it really felt like all paths led to jam jam being a finalist in a position where again he was a very likely winner again now again i think you can question like him helping carson in fire making carson was his biggest threat at the end someone that was probably the only person that could outright beat him but again i think at the end of the day he felt confident enough that he was going to beat carson in fire making so again just all around i think jam jam had an incredible social game was masterfully positioned by the end of the game and had a good chunk of win equity so while again i think there are some down points to his game particularly the sarah round and and his wanting to target of carolyn towards the end which to be fair even in that situation it probably wouldn't have mattered anyways he still had a path to the end i think overall jam jam played a very very strong game to where despite slightly less agency and win equity than carson at the very end of the game i think it is his pure positioning that ends up being one of the most impressive aspects of his game because that for me he is here number one but there we go i mean that is my player ranking for survivor 44 the end of my coverage for survivor 44 and obviously down the road i'll be doing the same thing for survivor 45 when that season airs in the fall obviously we have a bit of a downtime here in between major shows so our big brother obviously doesn't start until august though obviously when that starts you can expect more content on that and just in general obviously i'll still be continuing to do the similar style of videos that i have been doing i do intend on doing a top 10 players of the new era video relatively soon so you can stay tuned for that along with other casting what if 
five videos, rankings down the road. I mean, we are coming up on my 500th video on the channel, which is pretty insane, which for that, I'll be doing my top 25 reality TV seasons of all time. So that'll be a fun video. But with that, that is the end of my coverage for Survivor 44. Thank you for watching.